going to be talking about a real popular subject this morning. I'm going to be talking about sin. <laughs> and uh, it's really kind of tragic. Um, first of all, this isn't tragic, but it's amazing how as we gain the nature and character of God and as He reveals more and more of Himself to us, as you read certain books of the Bible, they take on new meanings. And uh, I decided to read in Leviticus, uh, starting on Monday, and I read the first 10 chapters of Leviticus, just all the different uh, offerings that they have. And I wanted to pick that book because, you know, so many people don't like Leviticus. They call it boring, and they, they, you know, they're trying to get through Leviticus just so they can say they read the whole Bible. And I thought, you know, it might be interesting, and I'm sure God put the thought in me to read Leviticus with the understanding of knowing what we know now versus what we knew like 10 or 15 years ago. And so I just started reading Leviticus, and, and like I say, the first 10 chapters were all about the offerings that you gave for, for sin, for trespassing, for guilt, you know, um, for a fellowship offering, you know, different types of offerings. And so I just wanted to read about those. And, and uh, it was just interesting how God has just opened up some things about sin. You know, it's tragic that sin has been taught so incorrectly. Um, yes, it's a bad thing, and it's been taught to, from the example is, is if you're a sinner, you're a bad person, and if you don't, you're a good person. And, you know, that's so base. I mean, that's at the bottom of the, you know, the, bottom of the, the lake, so to speak, as far as meaning goes. I mean, yes, there is that element of it, but uh, it goes so much further than that. You know, we've kept such a humanistic concept of good and bad when we talk about sin. In other words, it's almost as if if you're a sinner, God doesn't like you, and if you're not, then He does like you. You know what I mean? And nothing could be further from the truth. You know, and of course, we know that. We know that God loved you before you became a Christian, and He loves everybody. But it still, it carries that, that religious connotation gets in there, and somehow we pick that up in church, and we begin to carry that with us. And something I wanted to uh, just bring to the forefront this morning is that sin is extremely valuable to God. In fact, it's the highest valued thing you can offer Him. You know, you've, we've heard songs, we've heard people say, well, all I can give Him is my sin. You know, as though that's a real low commodity to God. To God, that's the highest commodity you can give Him. That's the highest value thing that you can give is your sin to God. That's one of the reasons it's so difficult to get people to give their sin up is because it's not only valuable to God, it's also valuable to the devil. It's the most highly valued thing in the spiritual realm that a human being can give. You can give all the gold, all the silver. God already owns all that. You know, this is only a small planet. If you gave all the gold that's in the earth to God, what do you think is on all the other planets all throughout the universe? That's you know, of no value to Him. You know, if you, if you recall uh, when God built the temple in Solomon's time, remember how it was built? Now everything was overlaid with gold and everything was gold and silver was counted as a common metal, you know. And, and uh, um, the, the, the value of the temple itself, the physical value, meant nothing to God. It's what it represented because it represented a type and shadow of the, of the church walking perfectly. And God could only use what was available on the earth to make it, and it was still a poor example, but it was the, the wealthiest example that man could see. You know what I mean? And, but the temple, the value, the monetary value, or the value that man sees in the temple meant nothing. And so when Jesus came you know, and ministered, remember when everybody was talking about how the, the temple was adorned with all of these different stones? See, that's where their value was. And to God, that meant nothing as far as the value. It was, it was what that type and shadow represented. And so sin is one of the highest, uh, it is the highest thing you can offer to God. So when people say, well, all I have is my sin to offer, they're not, they're not recognizing what they're really saying. Because it's a very high value item to God. It's the highest value that you can give. And, uh, you know, I started reading Leviticus. I told Kath that's where I was going to start. And I don't really want to read it, so to speak. But I, one of the things I recognized in the first 10 chapters was how costly it was to sin to people in the Old Testament. Um, 
every time you sinned, every time you uh, uh, didn't give a testimony when you saw something or you knew something about somebody or something, or every time you partook of the holy things incorrectly, or every time you sinned, you know what? You had to go give an offering. That's going to get pretty expensive. That's what it says. You had to give a bull. Sometimes it was a bull. Sometimes it was a goat. Sometimes it was a lamb. Sometimes if you couldn't afford it, you still had to give two turtle doves or two pigeons, and that still you had to pay for that. And so think about that. If every time you sinned, you had to bring a bull or a goat, how long do you think you'd stay in business? How long do you think it'd be before you'd be broke? And I told Kathy when I was, yeah, when I was reading this, I said, Probably part of the good news when Jesus came was they didn't have to sacrifice anymore, and it wasn't going to be cost them physically. I mean, we, we, monetarily, we know that sin costs us as far as sickness and disease and, and you know, mental attitude, things like that. But it also cost them monetarily. Is Every time they sinned, they had to bring something to the temple and sacrifice it. Now you know why they had such big flocks. That's why, they want, that's why they always wanted all of these sheep and why they always wanted all of these big flocks. Because you, you, if you didn't have big flocks, it wouldn't be long before you were out of business. You'd be starving to death. And so uh, as we recognize the costliness of sin, I, I, I want you to, I'm, going, I'm talking about Leviticus in the Old Testament, but as we go, I'm hoping the Holy Spirit will minister unto you so that when Jesus paid the cost, We'll recognize, we'll put the two and two and recognize the connection between the two. Do you understand what I mean? It says, you know, we were, we were purchased with things much more costly than gold and silver and rubies. And if we think about the cost that it cost the Old Testament people, then how much more costly was God's blood that, or Jesus' blood that saved us? And sin is extremely high value to God. So when you offer Him your sin, look, this goes into, this is why we're talking about suffering the last several weeks. This is why, it's, uh, why God likes it. This is why it says that it's been granted to us as a favor. And that's why all of those positive things about the suffering, the suffering that you choose, why? Is because every time you offer something, to, a, a sin to God, you're giving the most valuable thing you have to give to God. In other words, when you have the ability, and I'll just use these, uh, give you some examples. When you have the ability to be, to be angry, you see God as precious. Remember the woman who, gave the, who dumped the oil over Jesus? It says it was, uh, it was oil of spikenard, and it said it was very costly. Now, why is her story in the Bible? Because, yeah, because she gave something, she was representing, I'm giving you something that's costly. And remember when the disciples got all over and said, we could give this to the poor, you know? And he, she said, she has done this for my burial, and this will be a remembrance for her, a memorial for her, you know, forever. Because she gave of something costly. Why? Because she saw him as precious. Most of us don't, a lot of us don't see Jesus as precious. We like what he's done, but we don't see him as precious enough to give something of high value to him. And see, we think sin is, is nothing, so we, we, we throw it out. And we don't think, well, we're not giving anything of high value. That's the highest value thing you can give him. In other words, when you, when you have the ability to get angry or when you have the ability to be competitive or jealous or... Yeah, lust, any of these things, and you say, God, I'm giving this as an offering to you. It shows that you, sh it shows that you are, are recognizing him as being precious. Because you're giving something that causes you to suffer. Do you think she suffered given that oil of spikenard? Remember the woman who gave two mites? Remember how, how was everybody else giving? Out of their abundance. But she gave out of everything that she had. Do you think there was a temptation to sin and hang on to those two mites? More so than to hang on to your abundance? 
See, but she gave, that's why Jesus said, she's given more than all the rest. Why? Because she gave something that was of high value. In other words, what was the high value? Yeah, the two mites, but it was the sin to hang on to the two mites. She gave that. Some of us are priceless. I didn't know you all picked that up that quick. <laughs> We're all priceless. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think that if, if we understood what sin really was, what it meant to God, what it meant to the devil, I think, it would be a, I think people would receive the preaching of it a lot better. If we recognize that every time we give something of high value, uh, a, a sin to God, that, that's a high value. And uh, it's precious in God's sight when you give it. See, this is why Jesus is considered to be worthy to open the seals thereof. Why? Because he took the sin of the whole world, became sin, and offered it to God. The highest value that he could offer God. See, we have a tendency to get stuck in things that we see in the earth of having high value. And we have a tendency to think, um, uh, uh, and don't misunderstand me, but for instance, when we flag or when we wave or when we praise or anything, if we're doing it in a comfort area, I'm not saying God doesn't accept that, but when you do it and you have, in other words, we've talked about being in another service, right? Or another church, and they're not doing that. But you feel, in other words, a song comes up. I'm not saying you're doing it just to be arrogant or to be proud or to say, look what I know and you don't know. But a song comes up and it really starts to minister unto your heart. All right, is the temptation there to just stand there and do nothing? All right, but what are you going to do? You're going to offer that sin to God, and you're going to go ahead and wave and flag or bow or dance or whatever it is. I'm going to offer that unto God. Now you've got something of value to offer Him. You see what I mean? And what happened was in Israel was, just like everything else, is they had lost, when you read through Leviticus and you find out, you know, not only, I mean, we can, sure, we can talk about it, cost the animal his life, it's the, the life is in the blood, we've got, all of that is intermixed in this as well. But see, it said Jesus became sin for us. See, his blood wasn't sin, but it became sin for us. And so he offered that blood to God. And that's why he's worthy to loose the seals thereof. I mean, think about the, whole sin, the sins of the whole world. Look at the trouble we have just offering one of our sins. How tough it is. And he took the sins of the whole world. Now you know why he's so valuable. We have a hard time just giving up certain things. To God, you know, certain... I mean, we're, huh? we're getting... What did you say? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we all do, yeah. I know. And that's what I mean. But I think if we... And that's why I'm preaching this. If we will recognize the value of this thing is to God, I think it won't, it won't be just trying to get rid of things so that we can be better people. It's because we want to give something to God. You know, you've kind of ministered. Everybody's kind of real prophetic in this church, and a lot of people are saying that. You see, you kind of ministered that this morning. In other words, you're not just doing it now to get yourself free. You're doing it now because you see Jesus, God, as precious, and you want to give him something that's precious. You know, a lot of people will give tons of money to buy, you know, to make buildings and, and you know, lavish decorations and things like that. That is of no value to God at all. And that's why if you read in here and you find out, you know, you'll see God make statements like that, you know, these things really have no value. It's, it's God wants to dwell with men, not in a building. But people give all of this stuff and they think, boy, this is really valuable to God. No, it's giving of your sin. That's why people fight so hard against it. It's why they don't like kingdom now. It's why they don't like the good news. It's why they don't like, you don't, you don't have to be sick. You can be free from sin. Why? Because you're talking about the most valuable thing man has. 
Sin is the most valuable thing that man considers to be his of value. Oh, no, 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 my money is. No, 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 uh-uh. Money, your gold, your silver, all the things that you own, sin is the most valuable thing that you can have. And that's why people don't want to give it up. They don't want to give it to God. They want to hang on to it. Let's see, wasn't there a parable? What was the parable about the one? Somebody owed 500 denarii and, and the, another person owned 50. And what was it? What was the parable? Huh? The one that owed a lot, so he, forgave him. he forgave both of them, right? But wh- which one, see, which one loved him the most? The, in other words, that of the two people that owed, which of those two people loved the one that forgave? Which one of them loved him the most? The one he forgave the most too, right? And he said, so that those who have not, who don't think they have much to forgive, love little. But those who have been forgiven much, love much. So what does that mean? See, forgiveness doesn't mean just for wiping and forgetting about your sin. It's forgiveness has to do with the fact that you go and you offer that sin to God. You see what I mean? All of us have 500 denarii's worth of sin. There is nobody with 50 and one with 500. We've all got 500. It's just some think it's only 50. So they're not going to offer much sin to God. You know, when you have the ability, when the Scripture says to, to uh, you know, dance before Him, He loves to dance. He takes pleasure in it. Tell me, is there a temptation not to do that? What are the thoughts that come to you? They're going to think you're stupid. What else? It hurts. What else? Huh? What? You're going to hurt in the morning. What else? You're boasting to yourself. What else? I'm too fat to do this. What else? This is stupid. See? So what do you, so what, what do, you do? You take all of those. See, that's all stopping you from doing what God takes pleasure in. And you take that and you say, I'm going to offer this to you. Now, is that, would that be suffering? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to offer this to you because I see you as precious. I'm going to offer the most valuable thing I have, and I'm going to do what you want me to do. And most people aren't going to do it. So it works that way with tithes and offerings. It works that way with everything in the kingdom of God. Sin, you know, when you offer God your sin, you're giving Him the most valuable thing you can give Him. It goes with when you preach a message, when you sing a song, a spiritual song. You know, I know some of you, uh, we had some song this morning. Uh, tell me, is there a temptation not to do that? Why? What, what's, what's going through your mind? What's going through your mind? Yeah, is this you or me? Is this God? How am I going to sound? What are people going to think? But you now take that and you offer that to God. And he takes that as precious. And people say, oh, well, we kind of already know that. No, I don't think people really know that. Most people, when we preach about sin, we're still thinking about good versus bad. And so nobody, so the the church has gotten away from talking about sin because they don't want to make people feel bad. Well, if you talk about it from the standpoint of how valuable it is to God, that ought to make people feel good. You know, the more sin that you're in, or have been in in your past, in other words, the more sin you realize that you can get free of, the more excited you ought to become because you get to offer that to God. Think of all the precious things you can offer to Him. Think of all the things you just did this week that are precious in His sight that you could offer to Him. I'll read a few scriptures here. Like I said, I was just reading through there, and I, I, as I was reading through, and I said, you know, the, the guilt offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, I thought, man, we'd all be broke in a week. I mean, you'd learn to quit sinning, even though it was on the out, only be, not because it was in your heart to quit sinning, but you would quit sinning simply because it was going to cost you so much monetarily. 
if you actually followed what the Scripture said. And see, a lot of them got away from it. And, oh, that's what I was going to say, is that that's what religion does a lot of times, is that they lose the heart of what is supposed to be done, and they start doing the rules, or the rote. You know what I mean? They did that with circumcision, they did that with the offerings, they did that with... Uh, Every, we do that with everything, even the lifting of hands, the dancing. In other words, you can lose the heart of why are we doing what we're doing. In other words, you can give of tithes and offerings simply out of rote, can't you? Well, this is just something that we do. It's something I've always done. But instead of offering it to God and saying, you know, God, this is my, my tithe. This is my offering. This is, I want you to recognize that this is, represents the value that I see in you, instead of just giving out of the abundance. You see what I mean? Anything we can do can turn into rote, and we always have to remember, and I like what you prayed about our songs this morning, that's what I mean, we're real prophetic people, is because we're not just singing these songs out of rote. You need to be focused and thinking about and have the heart of what's going on in these songs, and when a verse comes up that reveals something, Tell me, when we're singing these songs, is there times that you can offer sin to God? Well, as we're singing? Then you're offering something of value, the highest value you can offer to Him, if you will offer it to Him. Now, I'm not saying, oh boy, let's go out and sin some more so we can give some more stuff to God. You know I'm not saying that. We've got enough to offer without doing that. Right? And so what you're doing is you're offering, you're, you're, you're choosing to either do something or not do something. Because you want to offer something of value to God. So if I don't want to be competitive, in other words, if somebody's doing something and I see somebody flagging so pretty or singing so pretty or operating in a manifestation, you know, and I get, let's say, just take me for example, I get upset because this has happened, hasn't it, Kathy? <clears throat> Pastors, they want to do it all. And they don't think anybody should do anything. And if I see something happening, you know, and I start to get jealous, I say, hey, I can take this attitude and I can offer it unto God and stop it. And God will take this as high value. See, we always think it's the outward appearance of things. My beautiful voice. And, and voices are beautiful, aren't they? I'm not... I'm, <laughs> I mean, the beautiful, okay, let me rephrase it. The people who have beautiful voices have beautiful voices, right? Certain people are anointed to flag in here. You know, certain people can sing real good in here, right? Though that's pleasing to the ear and pleasing to the eye, right? But if somebody, and, and this is what I've always said when we start prayer, I always listen for the struggle, the heart struggle that people are trying to make a connection with God with. That's what God thinks is precious. Because they're laying down their ability to stay silent, and they want to make a declaration to God, and you can tell they're suffering doing it. You know what I mean? So when you look at somebody that can sing and that has talent, that's great. But when you look at somebody that maybe doesn't have such a great voice and knows that they don't or can't flag as well or can't do something as well, but they go ahead and do it, they go ahead and do it, what happens? There are, you, you recognize that offering to God. That's why some of you cry when some people offer something, and it may not sound the best, beautiful voiced. It may not be, you know, choreographed the right way. But I'll see tears in people's eyes. Why? Because you're recognizing that somebody is offering something of high value to God. And I'm not saying somebody with a beautiful voice or can flag good or isn't doing exactly the same thing. I'm just saying that so many times. We do these things, and that's what religion did, is they'd lost the heart of everything, and now they were just doing everything by rote. See? And that's one of the reasons they crucified Jesus was because he came to take their sin away, and for the religious crowd, their sin was of high value. They valued that. See, the demonic realm values it as well. Sure, it's a different reason. See, here's, here's the thing is, is that when you offer it to God, He empowers you. When you offer it to the devil, you empower him.
because God is on your side. God wants to empower you. The devil wants you to empower him. See? There's a lot more to this than what I'm telling you. I just, this is just, you know, I'm just getting the beginnings of this thing, you know. And uh, I just, as I was reading, through, like I said, through Leviticus, I just began to realize, and as God began to speak to me, I just began to realize how out of balance we are when we talk about sin because it's always that good, bad thing. You know, and it's always that condemnation thing. And it's, well, let, okay, well, let's not deal, let's not talk about sin so much. But when you read your Bible, there's a lot in here about sin. And I think, like I said, the reason is, is because we have gotten messed up on, like everything else, our definition and, and the value that it has for God. God considers it a very, very high value to him. Here, turn with me to Peter. I think it's first. Could be second. <clears throat> no, I think it's first. <clears throat> yeah, First Peter chapter two. Now, as I read this, I want you to think about how I've been teaching this morning, okay? So, uh, because a lot of people, when they read this particular set of scriptures, they're, they're, uh, they already have a preconceived idea because of everything that we've been taught. But I just want you to think of this as I've been teaching this. Starting in chapter 2, verse 4, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. Now, why are we being built into a spiritual house? I know, but you know, we're his body, he wants a place to dwell. But how are we being built as a spiritual house based upon what I've been ministering to you this morning? We're being built as a spiritual house because of all the offerings that we continue to give. You see what I mean? The offerings of sin that we give is what's building us into a house. If you hang on to your sin, are you going to be built into a spiritual house? Absolutely not. It's because we see him as what? A precious stone. And notice what it says. Uh, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a what? A holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What's an acceptable sacrifice? There you go. Giving your sin. See, what was the sacrifice in the Old Testament? Bull or goats, but didn't that cost you? And what did, what did God command when He wanted you to give the bull and the lamb and the goat? What, what, what did He say? They had to be what? Perfect, spotless, without blemish. And of course, we find out what happened in Malachi. What were they giving? Yeah, what, it, what, it had, what had it gone down to? They were giving the, blind, the blind, the lame. You see what I mean? The, the, uh, the spotted, the sick. That's what they, see, that's what, in other words, they had figured out a way to give less to where it wouldn't cost them as much. Apply that to today. And so it says that we are offering spiritual sacrifices. See, what's a spiritual sacrifice? See, we always think of spiritual sacrifice as preaching or a you know, a word or some such thing as that. Tell me, isn't sin a spiritual thing? Absolutely. And so that's what we're doing, is we're offering something that is costly to us. You know what? When you offer your anger pure, without spot or blemish, what are you offering? <laughs> You're offering... The whole thing. The best, you have, you're offering the best that you got. 
How many of you are really good at getting angry? How many are really good, huh? Yeah, you're really, I mean, it's... Think about how many people brag about certain things, huh? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. telling somebody off. You know, see, that's the best that they can give. But so many times we want to give of the blemished, the sick, and the lame. We we keep see what was what were they accusing the, the, the Jews of? They were keeping the best for what? Themselves. So we'll offer God something here, we'll offer God something here, but He wants your best. He wants your best sins. Yeah, what's your best at? What's your good at? What are you good at? How many are good at controlling? (laughs) How many are good at manipulating? Dominating? Huh? Yeah, anything. Competing. <laughs> That's because her and I are alike. He said, he's only spoken about one thing about me, but everything about as he said you. That's because that's because we're alike. See, we're competitive. Um, I, I don't remember all the things I said. What do you remember now? What was it? I know we're competitive. Dominant. Dominant. Controlling. Controlling. Manipulating. Manipulating. How about, how about lackadaisical? Yeah. I mean, what was it you were telling me here uh, about the people who read their Bibles? How many don't read their Bibles? Bedford. Okay, 90 million. So they do read it or they don't? 60 million. Yeah. So, so how about, so can we say lackadaisical, don't read their Bibles? Don't see value in it. How about, you know, I mean, we can go on and on, right? I can just go on and on. But whatever you're best at in sin, that's what God wants. He doesn't want you're spotted, you're wrinkled, or you're blemished. I can say, well, I don't smoke. See, or I don't drink, or I don't do certain things. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't look at pornography. All right, but that's spotted and wrinkled and blemish. What am I best at? Me. What am I best at? What? No, no, no. I mean, I mean, talking about uh, in uh, yeah, yeah. Anger would probably be one of mine. You know, because. Uh, you know, I mean, I get angry when it snows. And I've been trying to deal with it in a sense. I've been trying to offer God, even before I knew this concept, I've been trying to offer this to God because, you know, I know that I always say this to myself, but I, it's always after I get angry for a little bit. I always say, you know, there's people getting chemotherapy that would love to be out here in this snow, that would gladly trade places with you. You know, the trouble is, is that doesn't come to me until. Right after, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not like I carry my anger for a long time. It's just you get angry and then, then you think, oh man, you can't do that. But see, those are things that, that he wants your best. He doesn't want the spotted, the blemished, or the sick. He wants whatever it is that you're best at. And so you offer him your best. You offer him your oil of spikenard. You give him your two mites. That's the best you have. Yeah, fear's one. How about fear? You give him that one. And you say, I'm giving you this. This is my offering. Now you say, well, how do you do that? You just, and first of all, you admit that you have it. Yeah. And, then, and then say, God, I want you that when this fear comes on me, when this anger, competition, manipulation, whatever it is, dominating, wanting to be right, whatever it is, I want you to, to bring to my remembrance that I'm giving you this as an offering. And you know what they had to read, you know they had to do that over and over again in the Old Testament? 
So some of us think, well, I did that last week. How come it ain't working? They had to give every time they trespassed, every time they had a guilt offering, every time they sinned against God, they had to bring that poor bull, that poor lamb, that poor goat, that, those turtle doves or those pigeons, and they had to do it again all over again. And you say, yeah, but Jesus did it so we don't have to do it. That's right, but he also made provision that we could do it over and over again until we finally get it. And hopefully, spiritually in our heart, we'll recognize, you know, this thing is costing me a lot. And not just costing me, but I'm keeping my offering from God. I'm keeping my most valuable thing from God. What personality trait that the devil has a hold of in you that you can offer to God and have him change that personality trait? That would be of high value to him. You want to give to God? That would be of high value. Okay, I'll get through this. Anyway. Now to you who believe, listen to this. This stone, oh, wait a minute. See, I lay in, uh, go back. I, I'm sorry, I'm in First Peter chapter 2 still. <clears throat> well, I'm going to read, start reading in 5 again. It says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now remember, this is through Jesus. You know, we're not doing this on our own. Remember, he, did, he took all of this from us, so we're doing it through him, not just, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and do this on my own. No, now you're getting back into road again, see? And when you get back into road, when you get back into rules, what does that create in you? When you lose the heart and you have the rules, what happens to you? Yeah, you get religion. It's what we call legalism, what you guys call legalism. It's you're doing God things, but you've lost the heart to do them. See, and that can create a lot of problems in your attitudes, right? Okay. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe this stone is precious, how do we, how do we know? How do we know that stone is precious? That's right, because you're giving him the, your most prized possession. Trust me, your car, your money, your gold, your silver is not your most prized possession. You, some of the attitudes we have are our most, we guard them with our life. We guard them with guns. We guard them with uh, uh, walls. We guard them with arrows. We guard it with, those. that's the most precious thing that you have. And so how do we know he's precious? Is because we're offering the most precious thing we have to give him. That's how we know he's precious. See, precious, I mean, when we talk Bible stuff, you've got to understand, and I'm sure you all know this about me, is whenever I talk about Bible anything, it's always talking about action, not big mouth lip service. You saying that he's precious means nothing to me. It's, I want to see, what are you offering him? And I like, love to listen to a lot of the testimonies of the people in this church because, you know, they'll, they'll tell and they'll say, you know, I had this and I, you know, I'm, God's been dealing with me this. See, that's when it shows me you're seeing him as precious. But somebody just says, oh yeah, he's, he's, my, he's the pilot, I'm only the co-pilot. That doesn't mean anything to me unless I see action. It's like the binding and loosing thing that I've taught. You know, we've got such big mouth binding and loosing in the body of Christ. I bind the devil over the church. As I bind the devil, I bind the devil here and there. Yeah, but your actions are loosing the devil and binding God. So, you, so your lip service doesn't mean anything to me. So it's the same way with this scripture here. Is that when we see him, it says, to those who believe. Well, how do we know they believe? How do we know they believe he's precious? Because I want to see you offering precious things to him. Then I'll know that you think he's precious. Your lip service doesn't mean anything. You talking, you knowing the right answers, doesn't mean it. It's what are you offering that's precious to him? And that's why so many people talk like tithes and offerings, because money can have a hold on us, can it? I hate to keep going back to that, but it's such a base thing, and it's something that Americans understand, is that uh, you know, when, you, when you give of something, there's always the temptation to hang on to it, isn't there? I could buy stuff with it. Well, I really don't. I'm, I'm just going to give a, a pittance. 
I remember somebody telling me that this was, they said God told him this. And I'm thinking, that goes totally against Scripture. They said, God only wants me to give what I'm comfortable giving. Then it's not precious to you. Remember David? He said, I'm not going to, several times he said, I'm not going to give anything to God that didn't cost me anything. Remember that? See, because David had the idea, David had the concept that if you're going to offer God something, it has to be something that costs you, that was costly. So when somebody tells me, well, God told me, you know, I only had to give when I'm comfortable, then it's not costly to you. You're not giving anything of precious to Him. You're giving out of your abundance. You're just giving out of your comfort. See, David said, I'll only give that which costs me something to God. Why? Because David understood the concept of, I want to give something costly to God. And when you understand and start, that that makes Leviticus a lot more interesting to read when you understand the principles that I'm giving you. Man, I was able to read those ten chapters and focus. You know, most people, you start on something that's not interesting, and before you know it, you're over here and you don't even know what you read. You know what I mean? But I'm sitting there reading this, and as I'm reading this, all of these concepts are coming to me about how sin... It was costly. Uh, it, 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 costs, it costs us, sure, it kills us, doesn't it? It gives us bad attitudes, but it also gives us something of value to give to God. And so when we give it to Him, it's of high value to Him. And He considers that precious. Then you're becoming a precious living stone. Because why? Because you're offering up, what was it? Spiritual sacrifices. If people understood that, we'd like to hear about sin more often. How to, get, how, to, how to offer it to God. How do we get this, you know, God, oh, huh? What? Yeah, we want, you, you hear that all the time, but how do, you, how do we do that? Well, you just, first of all, like I said, you recognize it, and then you say, God, I want to give this. And when somebody's getting on your case or something, or you see somebody flagging and you wish you could do that, or somebody, the thought comes to you, well, I, I want to be a better preacher than them. Why does everybody like them more than me? You immediately say something like to God. You say, all right, here we go. I've got something precious now to offer you, God. Here's my thought. And you watch God change the way you're thinking like that. What? <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, but usually if, if you'll stick with it, it'll change you. Just like you said, you didn't want to pray because you wanted God to change your and you knew He would change your heart. See, that was a spiritual sacrifice trying to take place. God was asking you to offer that to Him, right? See, but you wanted to hang on. To, see, we, all, we all do that. I'm not just picking on her because we all do that. We want to hang on to it because it's of high value to us. You know, I want a pity party for just a little bit longer because that's really of high value to me. And the quicker you offer it, the quicker you get free of it. And God will accept your spiritual sacrifice. Yeah, it advances His kingdom. See, what, see when they gave those... When, look, when they gave of that animal, what did they get in return? Right, yeah, forgiveness, right? They got forgiveness. In other words, when, so when we offer up our anger, when we offer up our competition, when we offer up our manipulation, whatever it is that, you know, our, our wanting to hang on to our when we offer it up, guess what? The Bible tells us we're going to get something in return. I'm not going to give it up and stay with that same mindset. See, that's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness... <laughs> Forgiveness is a cleansing of the mind. It's not all on on God's side, well, okay, I'm going to forget about what you did. Something also transfers and takes place into you. Yeah, you get cleansed and what? And it says, and he does what? You get forgiven and what? Cleansed. That means that that thought should should start to be gotten rid of. You know what I mean? In other words, every time... uh, if something happens to me, and there's been times like when I wanted to get angry, if I immediately offered that up to God, 
all of a sudden, my whole mindset changed, and I wasn't angry about it anymore. Why? What happened? Yeah, I got, no, I got, not only I got cleansed, I got forgiven, and I got cleansed. My mindset changed. Now, you have to go through it again and again and again, but eventually you reach the point to where you've given that offering to God, and now He's going to work on another offering in your life. <laughs> okay, where were we? Now, to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Why does it cause people to stumble and why does it make them fall? Because what? See, why does it cause them to stumble and why does it cause them to fall? That's right. They want to keep their precious stuff. They want to keep what they're hanging on to. And so they stumble and they fall over that rock. And, and so we preach, you know, kingdom now. We preach you can be free from sin. You know, you would, it's always wondered. I could never, this has clear, clarified to me why people hate the good news so much is because they have to give up their most valuable possession. We always think it's our life. And yeah, the, we understand it, but that's such a general statement. But to tell people to give up sin, you would think that would be good news, wouldn't you? To be able to be free from sickness, that would be good news, wouldn't it? They hate that. You know why? Because sickness, all of those things are related to sin, and they don't want to give up their sin. It's of high value to them. And we always knew there was pleasure in it, but you, you always thought that gold and silver was of higher value. But when you read this and you begin to look through Leviticus, what it costs them every time they sin, you begin to realize... This is way more costly than gold or silver or anything else. They're going to be broke in a week if they're not careful. They're going to have to go to the temple and offer that. They have to take it to the priest, which means a long trip for some of them. I mean, it's great if you live next door to the temple or the synagogue, but what if you live out in the country? Not only do you lose your cow or your, your bull or your goat or your sheep or whatever it is you're taking in, you've got to now make a trip in. And it's not like you just hop in the car and drive in there. It's going to be costly. And I started reading that, and I thought, my goodness, these people will be broke like in no time flat. I thought, no wonder they wanted flocks, big flocks. And that was their main goal, so they'd have enough to cover what they were doing. They stumble because they what? Disobey the message, which is what they were destined for. But you are what? A chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, what? God's, what? Special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you, have, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Why are you a chosen people? Because you're offering your most valuable possession. You go back in here to Leviticus. There is one. It's kind of a little bit off of what I've been ministering, but I, I thought it was interesting to, to read or to give you. It's in Leviticus chapter 7. Leviticus chapter 7. Verse 26, it says, And whatever, wherever you live, you must not eat the blood of any bird or animal. Anyone who eats blood must be cut off from their people. So we come to Jesus' time, and of course you know the famous saying that he made, Unless you what? Eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. Well, see, again they missed what this was saying here. Yes, in the Old Testament, you would be cut off from the Jewish religion or the Jewish, you know, uh, people. So when Jesus said, drink my blood, what was he actually saying? Yeah, you're going to be cut, you're going to, what you're going to do is you're going to cut yourself off from your people. What people was he talking about? 
Yeah. Your family, your friends, you're actually cutting yourself off. Now, it doesn't mean, look, it doesn't mean that you never speak to them again or you become this isolated little group. What it means is, is that now you, just like we just read in 1 Peter, you're now what? A chosen people, a special people, what? Set apart a holy nation, which means what? For God's use only, right? That means you're now cut off from who else was using you before you became that? Yeah, the devil. Now you've been cut off from that, and now you've been added to something else. You've become a royal priesthood. You see what I mean? So you want to be cut off. In other words, you're supposed to be the thermostat wherever you go. Do you know what I mean by that? You go to Christmas party, you go we're entering into the holidays. We've already had Thanksgiving, right? Well, this is December, yeah. And we're coming up on Christmas. You're supposed to be the thermostat, right? You're not supposed to be the one having heat blown on you. You're supposed to be the one controlling the heat. How many of you ever go to these family things or these parties or any of these gatherings and you're the one that gets the heat blown on you instead of you being the thermostat? Now you get an opportunity to do what we've been teaching this morning. If God is so speaking, which I believe you're always to be the thermostat, how you do it is, is the important part, is to, you know, to be following God, not just blast stuff out there. But what are you going to do? How many times have people said things and you want to answer them back, but you don't want to cause a problem? You don't want to cause a confrontation. Well, now that you know how valuable that is to God, how precious that is, now you can offer that up, can't you? And say, God, I'm going to offer this up to you and I'm going to say something. I thought you'd all be jumping up and down at that. <laughs> yeah, but I always used to do that for the wrong motive. That's what I'm saying. Is it ha- that's what I'm saying. Be sure you're led by God and recognize. See, and, and you not only get to offer that up, but how many times do people say things like that and you get angry and you want to say something? See, now you've got two things that you can offer up to God. You can offer your anger up and you can offer your wanting to not say anything up. See, usually it's not one thing. Usually things are connected to one another. Do you know what I mean? So if you want to say something, yeah. But you don't want to say something because you don't want a confrontation. But you're angry because somebody else said something. See, now you've got two things that you can offer up. That makes it even more precious. Wouldn't it be best to keep your mouth shut? (laughs) If you could not get angry. Yeah, if it doesn't bother you at all then by all means, keep your mouth shut. But if you're sitting there seething because somebody has said something, what do we have to offer now? (laughs) Yippee! See, this is why so many people, that's why they stumble at the rock of a... That's why they stumble at Jesus, is because the minute Jesus wants to start taking something out of you, I know, we, we just love it, right? Right? We love it when God wants to take something out of us. That's why people stumble over Him. See, we like it when He's handing out His blessings. Yeah, the loaves and the fishes. But when He wants to start dealing with attitudes and things like that. You see what I'm saying? And, and a lot of times, they'll even hey, manipulation could be involved if, in you answering somebody. There's a lot of different things. So what you have to do before you answer is say, first of all, God, do you want me to answer? You want me to be the thermostat. You not, even get, you not getting angry could be a thermostat. Because you know a lot of people say things to try to trigger you. Did you ever know that? No, you didn't, you, know, you didn't know that. That had to be a revelation, right? Sometimes people will say things to try to trigger you. And if you treat it as such, I mean, if you, yeah, if you treat it as a trigger, see, now there's something you can offer to God. And don't treat it as a trigger. I remember somebody I was with one time, and they, they, we had visited somebody else, and they said uh, somebody else that we were visiting said something about, you know, talking about some miracles that were happening, you know, and, 
And so we got back in the car, and this person said, uh, you don't really believe all that stuff, do you? And I said, I just kind of laughed, because I knew what it was designed for. See, that's designed to trigger for you to become on the defensive, to defend what was being said. And I said, I just kind of laughed out loud, and I said, now look, I says, do you really want to know, or you just want to argue? But I said it real jovial, real, like I wasn't angry or anything like that, and it just diffused the whole situation right there. You know, if I would immediately gone into, oh yeah, I really, yeah, I, yeah, because the Bible says that, then they'd had me, because now I'm on the defensive and I'm defending something. But when I said that, it lightened the whole thing and it, it shut that person down because I didn't take the trigger. You see what I mean? And so uh, I offered God, yeah, what's the first thing you want to do when somebody says something like that? You want to defend it, right? And so even when I get on my forum, you know, when people, when it get, turns into a God thing, you know, I have to sit there and I have, to, I have to offer a lot of stuff to God because I'm thinking, do you really want me to answer this? Because I'm, I'm really upset at some of the things some of these people are saying right now, you know. And most of the time, God just says no. And then sometimes when I answer, I have to sit there and as I'm reading, writing my sentences, I have to think, Okay, now I don't want anything defensive. I don't want anything angry. I don't want to point anything out or accuse anybody of anything. How can I exalt God and make people think without coming across, you know, being in error? God, I, want, I mean, I want, if it comes out strong, I want it to be you, God. If it comes out a real blunt statement, that's fine. But I don't want to add my own stuff to it. I want to offer that to you, and I want you to give this. You see what I mean? So we have to keep something in mind is how, how, whatever sin that we offer to God is going to be directly proportionable portion to how we, we see him as a precious stone. So if you give little, you don't see him very precious. If you give of your best, you see him as precious. He'll be a precious stone to you. And you'll be built as a living stone because you're offering acceptable sacrifices to him. Amen? Any questions? What if there's just so much anger, say? <clears throat> what if, I mean, overall, there's just so much on the earth. Mm -hmm. And when you give in to that, mm -hmm. you spend it in the earth mm -hmm. and build the kingdom here. Mm -hmm. But when you offer it to God, mm -hmm. he takes that, replaces it with his kingdom. Then it sets a stage for sin free. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And your little offering of that anger is not spent reinforcing the world's kingdom. Absolutely. But it's spent on him. Right. And he's able to. Right. Recycle it into his kingdom into right. the earth. See, that's what you, the, we were talking about, the binding and the loosing. See, what are you doing? You're binding, when you do that, you're binding anger, and what, but what are you loosing? You're loosing the value of, of, <clears throat> of no anger onto the earth. You see what I mean? That's what you're doing. Ab absolutely correct. And so as we do that, as we offer these things to God, Look at what we're loosing on the earth. I mean, this is, it goes more, like you said, it's not just about us, right? It's not just about, oh boy, if I can get rid of my anger, I won't get sick or this, that. There's that part of it, obviously, because God is such a giver. But you're loosing, you know, it says, let this heart be in you that was the same in Jesus who died for the sins of everybody. Well, how can that be in you? Because what are you doing? You're, you're, you're taking what's precious to you and giving it to God, but you're helping, just like you said, James, you're helping other people. We can't see that with our physical eyes. It's something you have to see in the spirit realm, and obviously you did or you wouldn't, you wouldn't have said it. You're, you're able to see that. And so now we need to start loosing that in the earth and offering God these sacrifices, and that's what will start being loosed in the earth to some extent. At least it'll, it'll make the atmosphere more non-conducive for the devil to do what he wants to do. Well, this is so good, and like you think, like I'm thinking about all kinds of things, and you think about like the church for the most part 
has the, has this idea of what sin is mm-hmm. or this definition of sin or even the definition of what's precious, you know, that kind of thing. And I was thinking about, like, you know, the Pharisees and how they were so angry and how they looked at, you know, sin a certain way, mm-hmm. even though they were full of it themselves. Right. And how when you were saying how, you know, about if you drink the blood, you, you cut yourself off from the world, you also cut yourself off from religion, too. Yep. You know, and, and also the cultural, social norm, you cut right. yourself That's off right. from that. Yep. And so it's like what you're saying, man, my heart is just like, oh, this is so good, this is so right. Like there's some in your brain when you hear that, it, it kind of tilts you a right. little bit because we look at it like we look at sin as the gambling and smoking and, you know, all that kind of stuff yeah. and, and, and to our bad attitudes, but we don't see it as something that's precious to offer to God, even though it right. is, yeah. you know, I don't, it's just, it's <laughs> like there's that feeling on the inside where it's like, it's just so good, it's so God, but your brain is trying to wrap itself right. around, yeah. you know, even just the, um, the uh, what do you what's the word I'm looking for? The implications of this, yeah. like the, the further effects of this, of what you're saying. Right. It's just kind of blowing my mind a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't even really say what I want to say. I just, well, yeah. A great church service can be precious to God or it can be a stench in his nostrils, depending on what the heart is. You know what I mean? In other words, if all the outward appearances of a great church service are going on, the, 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 you know, the loud worship and the dancing and the jumping, yeah, but you're like, like we talked Wednesday night. I know I had a hard time Wednesday night not getting into this because when I have my message, it's hard to talk without starting into something. But you have a name, but you're dead inside. You know what I mean? Now it's a stench in his nostrils. Now if it, the church service is going on and people are offering God Things. In other words, the things that are being done are being offered by people who it would be easier if they didn't do anything. You know what I mean? In other words, a lot of the people in here, you give, uh, you give words, you, give, you sing song, you preach, you lead worship and things like that. See, those, again, this all goes to things that we're choosing to do, right? Those are all spiritual sacrifices. But what happens is, is that as it becomes easier it becomes less of a sacrifice. You know, in other words, we become comfortable in it. Right, and like what you're <clears throat> saying, it's not like we didn't know this, but it's like something about how you're saying yeah, it, know. bringing it, it out, it, yeah. it's, it's bringing a full, I can't even put into yeah. words what I'm I wanting know, to I say. Couldn't either. But it's like we already know this, I mean, we give the sacrifice, we do it anyway, that kind of thing. Yeah. But there's something about when you're saying the word sin and just looking at it from a new perspective, yeah. It's just doing something on the inside of yeah. me. I can't explain. Yeah. I can't explain it. Yeah, I, that's what it did to me. Is it's just a different, I guess, twist on it, or a different con, a, di- a coming around a different way. That um, you know, I've never heard anybody say that sin is highly valuable. Now, I'm not saying they haven't said it, but I've never heard anybody say sin is highly valuable to God. But it is, and uh, because the Old Testament type and shadow shows that. By, ha- by you had having to take the best, and every time you sin, you had to take the best and sacrifice it. Well, what did God give? He gave his what? Did he give us a spotted? Did he give us a lame? Did he give us a, 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 a blind? And what did he become? He became sin. And when he became sin, <clears throat> you know, that's when... And that's, yeah, that's right. And that's when God gave him the name that was above every name. See, and two, you think about like the spotted and the, the blemish. You know, it's like we think about, sometimes we think about the sins. God, what do I want to say? Yeah. You know, like, it's, it's like we give that, and this, those are, it's good to give like the smoking and the drinking and sure, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. And also we give to the, the, you know, that has the circumstances, the bad circumstances that go with it. You know what I mean? Um, and it's so much fuller than what I can explain. I know, it is me too. That's because we all know, it's like, yes, it's about the attitudes and the heart. We all know this, but there's something, there's something that's being unlocked here that I yeah. cannot put I my know. See, that's why. To. Listen, this is why I preach the things that I preach to the people that I preach it to, is because I know, I know that in the coming weeks, somebody's going to get some of this other stuff, because I know how you all are. You'll focus on it. You'll bring it back Wednesday, next Sunday, or sometime, and something else will be built on it. The main thing is, is you've got to focus on your own. 
looking at sin as how you described it in the beginning. Instead of looking at sin as everything that you do wrong, mm -hmm. this sin that I think you're talking about is <clears throat> what shapes and forms us and gives us our earthly identity. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you're offering that earthly identity or the way people see you, the way you want people to see you, everything that f shapes and forms you and makes you part of this kingdom, if you're offering that <clears throat> to him, that's what, because it didn't make any sense at first when you started, when you said it's such a valuable commodity, and I'm thinking, well, I'm rich then. You <laughs> that's know? right. But it's when you look at it as it's everything that makes you part of this uh -huh. earthly system, of course you're going to give it up. I mean, mm -hmm. of course that's extremely valuable, you know? I yeah. mean, and it's just, look at the easier for man to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, that's a completely different way of looking at a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Think about the scripture that says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. How, how does that happen? Yeah. Because we're offering him the kingdoms of this world. You know, when we throw our crowns down, what does that mean now? You know? Anger is a crown. Manipulation is a crown. Fear is a crown. Yeah. It, it's a, and what does crown represent? Rulership. And what are we doing? We're throwing them because, see, that's a crown... When you see a crown in the earth, what do they usually look like? Yeah, what are they made of? Precious, precious, see, value. You know, they talk about the crown jewels, you know, and the value of them. And what are you doing? You're throwing them down at Jesus' feet. But what crown did Jesus get when he went to the cross? Thorn. Yes? Oh, Kathy's over there. <laughs> I was just thinking the word that we had this morning, you know, about following Jesus and why you're saying this. I keep thinking over and over that's what he said, that, you know, if you follow me, follow me. And he would open his heart and his love toward us. And, and because he is the author and the finisher of the faith, you know, he showed us how to do all this. And as he took on the sin and gave to the Father, and of course it set mankind free, and we don't take on all the sin of the world. We already <laughs> have it, you know, and as yeah. we keep offering it, following his example, and when he says, do this, don't do this, give this up, you know, don't say that, or do say this, you know, whatever it is, each day is something different, and we offer that to the Father, you know. He's pouring out his heart and everything and his love and causing us to grow even more. And, you know, it just expands the kingdom and his dominion and rule because it starts in here and then eventually it spreads and then it mm -hmm. out in the world. Do mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The dominion that he has. Yeah. It's just powerful. Yeah. They gave him a crown of thorns because they saw no value in it. They gave him the least precious thing. That's the crown they gave him. What are we giving him? Our most precious crown. See. So when James was talking, it, uh, it reminded me of the scripture, to be in the world but not to be of the world. Mm -hmm. And so all those things that, um, that God's the sin as the preciousness as we lay that down, it's precious to him. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, no. it's gone. Oh, man. It'll come back. Well, think of it. Hey, this will give you something for Wednesday night. You think of it. If it comes back, okay? Okay, anybody else? <clears throat> And, you know, I use smoke, and smoking and drinking, that's probably the least, if that's even, you know, that's just something that the, ch the church thinks is, yeah, it, it, it will, you know, destroy your lungs and stuff, but it's probably a very low, 
you know, I'm, I'm mainly talking about attitudes and things like that. And, uh, you know, yeah, oh yeah, it's big, it's big, yeah, it's big. Yeah. Cassie said that one time that God told her, you see what sin has created, but I see what God is, what I have created. And what James was saying is we're giving our identity and it's like, it's like we're giving away. And Danielle even mentioned this Wednesday night about we're giving away what was never meant to be us anyway. Mm -hmm. And it, it is a precious thing though, because that's your security, you know, that's your, your identity or who you think you are or, you know what I mean? Like yeah. what, what defines you and you're giving that up that's very precious to God, even if it's yeah. not so good stuff. You know what I mean? It's what makes you feel safe. Like fear a lot of times makes people feel safe. That's their little safe place. Mm -hmm. And so it might be even be a bad thing, but we find it precious because we find safety in it or right. it's familiar Absolutely. to us. Yes. And so we, you know, we give it that's very precious to him because we're saying we trust you. Yeah. You know, you you're yeah. worth this. We believe that you're better than anything this could give me. Right. You know. Right. Um, it also gives meaning to when we read what Babylon is dressed in. The precious stones, the gold, you know, the fine linen, the purple and the scarlet. <clears throat> See, the woman, you know, the harlot, what she's dressed in. See? Well, you know, what, it, what is false religion made of? No, false religion, what, yeah, it's the things of God, but they've been perverted. See, let's take anger for an example. Can you be angry? And not sin? Okay. So there is an anger that comes from God, right? So when we look at Babylon, we know that she's dressed in things that are God, but they've been perverted. So what, so what is in Babylon? Murder? Is that in Babylon? Adultery? Anger? Competition? All those precious stones. And so what, we're, what are we doing? We're taking those precious stones that are ours to give to God and we're dressing somebody else with them. We're taking the precious... See, God considers this to be precious to Him. He considers when we give Him anger, that's a precious commodity. If you give it to Babylon, it's a precious commodity as well. And that's a precious stone. I mean, to make it, to make it understandable in our... In our culture, we already talked about crowns, right? And what are crowns made of? I mean, if you're, if you're, if, in other words, the bigger country that you rule and the more money you have, what kind of crown are you going to make? You ever, you ever see those pictures of those generals or the kings from like around the early 19th century? What? Five minutes. What have they got on? Yeah, they got all these medals on and you think, did they give that to themselves? I mean, they got, they, their whole chest is covered with And it's like each one is trying to outdo. they got braids. and Have you ever seen those pictures? And they've got fancy hats, and they've got emblems on the hats and everything. And you think, what did you do to get all of these medals that are on your... Because you usually get a medal for bravery. What did you do? Probably nothing. You know, you probably made those for yourself and stuck them on there. Well, see, all of these things are precious to God, and if we turn and we give them to Babylon, you know, we're dressing her in those things, but they're perverted. So we find anger in the church, self-righteousness in the church, you know, competition in the church, jealousy in the church, lust in the church, love of money in the church, all of those things that were supposed to be offered to God and were now given to the false religion. And so she's dressed, arrayed in all of that... See, it, we look at it and we say, Those are all, that's all precious stuff, but that's all the stuff we were supposed to give to God, but we gave it to another religion. Well, uh, go ahead. The, uh, the, <laughs> the precious stuff, like you were talking about putting all the medals and stuff on, and then as you submit to that, it's... it's uh, dressing Babylon, but then there we are thinking, oh, well, we have all these medals, and look at this, and look, and it's just so valuable, and look at all this trophies that we have uh -huh. dressed on with the king stuff that you were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> Thanks, huh? Um, 
So, like with the metal stuff, that's just like we were talking about this morning. You, the eye of the needle thing. You, it, yeah. you have to lay it all down. Yeah. Okay, but what if it's so much bigger than even what you're saying? Like. Oh yeah. What if it's like the nature of man? Like, mm -hmm. like what we think mankind or human beings are supposed to be. Yeah. Like, okay, absolutely. so this thing's been going off, and it's like there's a man on the throne. Like, Jesus came and became a man. To sit on the throne, and that hits me so hard that a man can sit on the throne in rulership of the whole earth, and that we're supposed to be like him. It's like it's not just laying down your, and that's part of it. It's not just laying that down, but what if it's our whole identity of what we see mankind yeah. was supposed to be? And it's something that's not been seen on the earth before. We don't know how God originally created man to look. And we have this idea, like, even that you have to die. That, that's so hard to wrap your mind around because we look at men as being so sinful and so they deserve to die or death is part of the circle of life or all the stupid things that you mm -hmm, hear people mm -hmm, say. Mm -hmm. What if it's so much bigger than just laying down what we define as sin? What if it's laying down our whole concept of what mankind looks like our mm -hmm. whole identities of what we think we're supposed to be yeah. as men like what if it's so much bigger than we can even see and and comprehend right now yeah it is that's why when i read yeah that's why when i read about jesus i see i'm looking at a man who is completely different well i mean not just when i say completely different it's so far different it's like Another ra another species, a whole nother, yeah, uh, like, yeah, from another planet, so to speak, to make it more easily understandable. You know, like, an, like he's coming from another planet, because all his concepts, every, the thing that he exalts, man thinks lightly of, everything that he thinks lightly of, man exalts, and it's like, how, that's why I always think, could I walk with this guy? How, could I walk with this man and put up with this? I mean... Yeah, that's probably why we're living now is because, could, I mean, and how did these disciples do that? You know, they were pretty good guys to be able to walk with him and put up and, and you know, not just cast him off as being some kook because that's what his family thought. They thought he was crazy. So, I, yeah, it's, this is way bigger. It's so big I can't even comprehend it, so I don't even try because it's like my mind will go fall out of my head be about this much come out of my ear and that's it that's, you know yeah well arguably okay you saw that first peter first peter yeah go ahead it's a one line i mean okay um it, well you stopped at second P or first peter 2 uh 10 but right next to right down it says dear friends i urge you as aliens <laughs> and straight to the world like we are aliens yeah absolutely <laughs> like we're supposed a to be race i mean like what you said a different we're supposed race. to be aliens but go ahead i hate to change it for just a we, it, we, uh, we know we're supposed to be aliens, but we keep trying to fi figure out a way to kind of be alien, but kind of be an American. An American <laughs> yeah, a, a still a, we're trying to bridge, you know, being the, like, go back and forth so we don't look too alienatic, you know That's what I mean? That's all we know. What? It's, yeah. It's, it's all we know. <clears throat> and there's more than what we know, man. You know, I mean, it's so cool. You talk about things not seen on the earth. This is all we've seen. Right. You know, yeah. we see glimpses into the heavenlies and get revelations mm -hmm. and we get knowledge. But this is still what we're grounded in. Right. We're still grounded Absolutely. in yeah. earthly things. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, is that so much comes to the church and we abort it. Yeah. We abort it because we don't want to appear too alien. See, this is where you and I live. Absolutely correct. And that's what we're trying to come out of. And that's why we need to receive messages you know, that are alienatic to us, as long as they're scriptural and as long as they can be backed up by scripture, and as long as it brings us the kingdom of God closer, you know what I mean. I mean, you don't want to preach some weird, you know, queer bait stuff that some of the stuff that's gone forth in the earth, you know, from the church. But you want to be, uh, since that's where we live, you want to receive that because each little piece that we receive, receive, bring us closer to being an alien. You know what I mean? Every little bit of offering that we 
That's right. Too. Every little bit of offering, absolutely. Every little bit of offering transforms. Tra- transforms. And just listening, you know, w- w- so many times we have a tendency to think we've got to make this happen. No, you just got to receive it, trust God, and believe it. And you know what? That will, that will start to automatically... That's why it says, if you continue in my word, what's going to happen? That you'll know the truth and what? What's the truth going to do? It's going to make you free. We keep trying to make ourselves free. And there's an element in that where you make a joint effort with God, but so many times we want to make an effort by ourselves. If you read the parable, I was going to read that this morning, but I don't want to read it now. The parable of where they said, you know, anyone who counts, remember the one that says, if, if be, uh, it says anyone who hate, doesn't hate his mother, brother, sister, this, that, cannot be disciple, and whoever does not take up his cross cannot be my disciple. And he goes into this parable and he says, he makes a statement, he says, uh, how, which of you uh, building a tower doesn't first sit down and count the cost after, in, unless after you've made the foundation, you're not able to finish. And how many of you with 10,000 can meet 20,000, but send a delegation and make peace a long way off? What is that scripture about? That is a self-sufficiency scripture. Because with God, you'll be able to finish the tower. With God, you'll be able to defeat 20,000 with your 10,000. But if you're starting to count the cost, you're already putting yourself in self-sufficiency. You're already sunk. Because you're putting yourself, you're already starting to count the cost. Once you start counting the cost, you're done. You don't count the cost. What you do is you recognize, I can do how many things with Christ? Oh no, surely I should have to count the cost, right? To see if I can do everything with Christ, right? No, with Christ, I can do all things. You can defeat 120,000 with 300 people in one sword if God is on your side. But if you're trying to count the cost between 10 and 20,000, you're already into self-sufficiency and you're done. So there is a joint effort that we make and the joint effort is I offer my most valuable possession. I throw my crown. We sing that, that song where we throw the crowns down. What are you throwing down? We say, well, it's our sin, but I don't think we recognize the value of what we're throwing down. We're throwing down a most valuable thing to us when we throw that thing down. I mean, it's great to do this if you have the heart of you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're just doing it because everybody else is doing it and it looks spiritual. But you got to know the heart behind that. And we're throwing down our most prized possession. It's something that we've lived with. Like you said, it has defined who we are. It's gotten us a lot of different things. You know what? Uh, Temper tantrums can get you... Have you ever watched kids throw temper tantrums? Why do they do that? Do you think they consider their temper tantrum valuable? It gets them anything they want, doesn't it? So that's a highly... The stuff that they get isn't near as valuable as that temper tantrum because when I get what I want, what do they usually do? They don't want it, but they're going to hang on to that temper tantrum. They're going to hang on to that attitude, aren't they? Try to get rid of that for them and watch what happens because it's so highly valuable to them. And you're throwing down your most prized possession when you do that. And so as we listen to these things, James and everybody, that's what happens is we, you allow God to change. See, what's happening is we're binding and we're loosing when we come to these services every week. We bind and we loose. Now, what are you going to bind and what are you going to loose? When we speak, when we sing, when we preach, what are we going to bind and what are we going to loose? And if we loose the kingdom of God, you know what? It's going to start affecting us. It's going to start affecting us. It already has, yeah. We've seen it in action already. And it's going to start affecting us even more. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's, it's great and it's, uh, I'm excited. But it's so much bigger than what, God, it's just, I don't know, I can't even. Even just us, <laughs> even just us talking, though, it's like, it's like that feeling on the inside of me, like, Gah! it's like it's, you're putting voice to right. that. Yeah. And like when you were saying about, you know, knowing the truth and truth will set you free, just like what you're saying, it's like being free, not just from our stuff, but being free from the worldly identity of what humankind is. And then I was thinking, well, no, no wonder Babylon looks so good. It's because it's that worldly idea of what humankind is and what the church. It's like that's why it looks so good to the church. Right. You know? And that's why it's so fooling or deceptive fooling, to the church. Fooling, yeah, absolutely. Because you've not seen right. anything outside of what 
the enemy has created, uh -huh. you know what I'm saying, uh -huh. as humankind and what we're actually supposed to be. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So that's what I say. It, it'll bail. Huh? What? Yeah. I'm yeah. Thinking, oh, this is so good. Yeah, new yeah. creation, new creatures. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's big. It's so big. I, you know, you get these things, and I get them, and I think, and it builds during the week, and I think I can tell it's okay. Great. This is like like the the sand foundation. You know, the the cement hasn't even been poured yet, and you're thinking. And more stuff just keeps coming to you and coming to you. And even as you're preaching it, more stuff comes to you. And you're still thinking, like, we're still in the sand. We're still trying to level the sand out here. You know what I mean? That's how you feel. Yeah, 100 years to build a boat. Okay. Anybody else? Nobody? Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. And we just, once again, we believe in your divine influence on our hearts. Without it, we're sunk. But we believe that as we preach and as we sing these songs that we get for praise and worship, even as people, as people flag, as they give words, all of those things have meaning and are loosing something in the earth as well as binding something else. But God, I want to pray for all of us here that, Father, that each one of us always continues to have the heart of why it is we do what we do. And we never become, it never becomes rote. It never becomes less valuable. And that, that God, as we continue in this, we recognize, in fact, our sin will become more valuable to you. As we give it to you, we recognize the value that it has. And it becomes even a greater value in the coming weeks, months, and years. And Father, we just thank you so much that you created a system that looks so backwards yet works so perfect. I just can't, it's, can't fathom that. And so, Father, we just thank you once again for your greatness, for everything you've given to us, and that, God, even though we're still in the sandbox level here, we're further than we were. At least we're starting to set the foundation. And we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.